This is a podcast from ComediansComedian.com. This is the Comedians Comedian Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stuart Goldsmith and in this episode I'm talking to Tom Ballard, plucky young comedy wunderkind, uh, Australian guy. We met in, uh, in Melbourne, we've met all over the place, but uh, we recorded this conversation without an audience uh, around Tom's house in Melbourne and it is very much a comedy house, as you will hear. Uh, Tom is going to be at the Edinburgh Festival this year, so if you're going to be there, I would highly recommend his show. He's reprising the show that I saw earlier this year in Melbourne and it is an excellent piece of work um he is as you will hear he's just one of those kind of uh young fated we talk about this it's quite interesting he's he's um someone who just started winning things early doors and uh and kind of went through i think probably quite a precocious period of uh, of everything falling at his feet uh, and now it's uh, i mean i'd love to tell you it all gone horribly wrong for him but no <laughs> no he's continuing to do uh, excellent stuff so uh, i hope you enjoyed this episode with Tom Ballard. Your show was absolutely superb. Thank you, Stu. It was so great, man. That's very nice of you. I Thank didn't you. see the very end of it. Ah. I have just read the end of it oh in the script God. that you had left ostentatiously lying around I your room. I didn't mean to. Listeners, I did not leave my script lying around my bedroom for Stuart Goldsmith to discover and ask me questions about. I, I feel as well, because it's unusual that I get to record in someone's bedroom. Let's just paint the picture. Oh, boy. There's, uh, there's a tobacco vanilla candle. <laughs> Um, it's very beautiful. There are some. Uh, it's not beautiful. That's there a lie. are no. Well, it is. There's. You know. You've got an ancient map of the world. It's good. It's the sort of thing like a cultured twenty-seven-year-old guy would have. I've got to. I got to move out. You, do you know what I really like? Is you've got. Um. You've got uh, some postcards up there, including yes. like postcards from shows from other comedians. Lawrence Mooney. I can see Jesse Cave. Olaf Falafel. Yes. I'm invading your privacy here by telling everyone what your private stuff is. It's totally but fine. this reminds me. This this cannot help but sound patronising. This reminds me. That you are a young guy. You're, are you? Are you? Are you twenty seven? I'm twenty seven. Because yes. this looks like my room when I was twenty seven, and uh, <laughs> it's nice to think to myself, oh yeah, one of the ways in which I'm a bit older now is uh, I, I don't really blue tack postcards of shit that I'm into to my wall. And I am I'm the poorer for it. I'm the poorer. You for are. It. Grandpa, tell me. Oh God, I will tell you about that later. Um, uh, I'm not about to be a grandfather. Um, you said when we came in, I didn't know what to expect because I know you've been on the radio for a long time. You are mm-hmm. a big guy here. I first saw your hour in Edinburgh last year and experienced the the Edinburgh Australia effect of going. Oh, Tom, this is a small room. He sold fine. Yes, it's a great show. Yes. Lovely time. Yes, come here. Oh, he's packing three hundred every night <laughs> and kicking ass. And it's just that moment of going. Oh, you're a bit famous. So I know you've done radio for a long time you've got a profile from doing that you're the sort of person who gets asked on reality shows about which we will speak a bit further like politically interesting (laughs) yes you know in intent at least not the ones that people Um, watch yeah yeah, exactly right um and so coming here i was thinking "Ah, i wonder if tom put all of the money he made from radio in i wonder whether he spunked it up the wall or whether he invested in property (laughs) So I got here to think, what will this be? And I have stumbled into a, 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 not a student house, but a it's comedian not house. that bad. Where, where Tommy Dasselow and Luke Heggie are recording an episode of, are they doing Dum Dum Club next yeah, door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are literally concurrent podcasts going on at the it's, moment. It's Podcast HQ. And that's much Look, more I, I chat should've. than I normally do at the beginning of no, an episode. No, no, I should have. So. God, I should have invested in, in property for sure. I was living in Sydney. I had to move to Sydney for the Virtual J Radio gig. And, uh, and well, for a while I was like, oh, I guess I could use this money. I mean, it's it's a, a public broadcaster breakfast radio money too, so people okay. think that you're earning way more than you actually are. Uh, but was paid perfectly well, um, and I should have invested that into some kind of house. But uh, there was a period where it was just felt a bit more like a you know sort of a weight around your neck, really, when I was. 21 22 23 24 um i wanted to be able to travel the world at a moment's notice and just move around and be a crazy creative comedian now i'm 27 i'm like i could probably do that and also be paying off a goddamn mortgage yeah because it's just it's i mean you know in london of course the same but here in in this country it is cripplingly uh depressing to the point where our politicians are saying "Eh, it's not a right to own a house it's a privilege yeah it's a dream yeah and if people want to get uh, buy a house, they should just get a good paying job. That's some advice from our investor 
politicians. There was a story yesterday saying that uh, one politician owns 33 houses. One of our federal politicians owns 33 mother flipping houses in this country. So good stuff. Anyway, yeah. Well, so I, no, it hasn't gone there. It's I, I. Yes, I've got some. I did save up a little bit of money, and and I'm hoping to invest in some kind of property sometime soon. That was <laughs> that was being <laughs> done. There was no need for that additional bit on the end. But like, um, but that was a good. That was a good. Uh, radio, that was a good radio edit. Mm. You've you've done the arrows behind the wheel. You know, Thank you know you. what you're on about. It's good. Cut. We can and sting. Great. <laughs> so. Let's let's look then at your show from the through the lens of that of this political awakening, mm. because I have only seen your last two shows. And I think in as much as my opinion is worth anything, this show, it was in a bigger room. It was sort of going off. Mm. It was I think it was much better than the, the sh- than your show from last year, which oh, I thought was you. fun. Yeah. And like, you know, the MDMA stuff particularly stands out as that was being really <laughs> funny. Yeah. You did touch on some political things, but it didn't have the intellectual heft. Right. Of the show that you that I saw you do at this festival, right. which you take the standpoint of uh, of the of examining the bubble of the left that you know the left wing bubble that you in which you reside, mm-hmm. and you just, can you tell us a bit more about this show and where it sits in terms of your I'm using the phrase political awakening because I read it in an interview that you did some time ago, so just talk to us about that for a minute and I'll I'll pick at things and challenge you on them. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, spunky boy. I shall let you know when you interest me. Um, yes, well, it is a bit funny because I was not going to do a stand-up show this year. I thought I, I did two last year. I did a the stand-up show, The World Keeps Happening, and a uh, comedy lecture about Australia's treatment of refugees. Was that the same one that you reprised this year, or is that a different yeah, lecture? Yeah, I'm doing one. Yeah, I'm do, I've been doing that a bit more this year, yes. So my thinking was originally, well, I could just tour that show, because I only did 11 shows of that last year. I worked hard on it. I wanted to tour it more. I could probably just do that. And then during Edinburgh last year, I saw Finn Taylor's Whitey McWhiteface. I realized that... I love writing stand-up comedy shows and why would I deny myself doing that again? And I just realized that this the thing that had been buzzing away in the back of my head constantly was political correctness. And the thing I loved about Finn's show was the cohesiveness of it and how it, the whole hour served one idea and was exploring one thing and it was him taking on something like white privilege and just leaning into it completely and being like every single routine is feeding into that idea and, and exploring that. And that really excited me. And I thought I'd love to do something like that. And I felt like political correctness was the thing that was sort of endlessly interesting and endlessly funny from lots of different angles. And so when I got back from Edinburgh, I was just sort of like, I'm pretty sure that's the show that could, that could make it work. Um, and then I'd had this experience of making this TV show, First Contact, uh, with alongside a uh, racist man uh, who worked for a political party called One Nation, which is basically our UKIP. And, uh, and that felt like a really good prism to explore that through as well. So it just all kind of lined up a little bit. And once I figured that out that that would be the hour, I got quite excited and just and actually started writing a, a shitload of material. A lot of it's rubbish immediately, but just it was easy for me to sort of pick something out of that debate and think I can write about that and because and, I find it interesting and I, and I don't know what I think about all these things. The show is riven with caveats of like, I think this, and then I think this, and I think that, but what about that sort of thing? But I think that's one of the great strengths of the show is that you are prepared to accept the flaws in your own reasoning uh, and to right. accept the grey areas in between the the, yeah. kind of the polemic ends of the, the yes. spectrum. Yes, yes. That you are, that you are quite, uh, that's the thing I find very difficult to do in my own stand-up. I end up every time I get excited and go, I really passionately think this. Yes. I'll read a really nuanced argument <laughs> online. Or if not a nuanced argument, a well researched, seemingly yes. viable argument by someone who I clearly disagree with. Yes. And I'll go back into my hole. Yes. And I'll go, Oh, but I thought but it's really obvious. I know and I retreat to, well, I know what I believe in my heart, <laughs> which is sort of <laughs> That's something, right? Sort of no better than what like a racist might say, Well, I believe in my heart that Totally. You wish totally. You yeah. So so you are are you well read within the sphere of of kind of political correctness and discourse and stuff i mean you've hosted australia's equivalent of question time i rudely call it as an outsider I have, I have, What's yes, it called no. q a q a yes yes uh i mean yes over the past couple of years i've tried to educate myself more about politics and since writing this show i have inevitably yes read millions of articles and watched 
members of the alt-right, uh, you know, at debates and lecturers on university college campuses talk about political correctness and trigger warnings and, and all that stuff. And then also just being sort of surrounded by some politically engaged young people, particularly who are really keyed into PC culture and what it means. And Do you mean other other comics or when you say young people, do you mean people younger than you or just your mates? Uh, uh, my age um, and... Uh, it, it, doing a little bits and pieces of political activism, you sort of cross paths with just really interesting people. I have a podcast myself where I interview um, politically minded people and and politicians and ask them why they believe what they believe. And so that's, you know, yeah, young Muslim activists and refugee rights activists and young queer people who are fighting for queer rights and stuff. Um, yeah, and I just, that whole world is kind of endlessly fascinating to me. And then, you know, also there's the angle of being a comedian, right? So, so many comedians rail against political correctness to the point where I find it almost edgy or interesting to try and defend it in some way, as, you know, Stuart Lee does brilliantly. Um, I kind of think that's quite fun because, at least in my circle of friends, you make fun of people who will talk about PC going mad. That's a ridiculous thing to say because clearly those people just want to be racist sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, so- I mean, it's, it seems to be a, a far easier position to defend to say, hey, well, you know, I can say whatever I want. Yes. You know what I mean? That, yes. that I'm not yes. specifically doing an impression of Brendan Burns there. I think that's, <laughs> that's my go-to older Australian comic. Apologies, Brendan. I know that you're not the person that I'm, uh, I'm using. Your well, he does, like, we've, we've talked about this. And, but he's so interesting because his show at Edinburgh last year was about Australia Day, right? And about how messed up it is that we as a country celebrate our national identity on a day that represents the dispossession of the First Nations people and the beginning of the invasion, right? Um. But then also as a section where he rails against political correctness. And I did his podcast and I talked to him. I said, not liking Australia Day, that's a politically correct idea. Like like people's definition of what me what is and isn't political correctness is so yeah. confused, I think. And often people will, you know, believe something that is politically correct and then say they're not a politically correct person. Yes. So Yes, yeah. it's frustrating, isn't it? Because the nature it's almost the terminology gives people an out, like the idea of being politically cor- correct. That ter- sounds yes. like something you're forced into by a parent or teacher. Yes. In the same way that feminism, the word feminism, well, yes. why can't it be equalism? Oh, shut <laughs> up. Just follow. You're already following the ideals. Why get caught up on the language or privilege or what? You know, sure, what sure. You? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, because everyone wants to think they're a decent person and a fair minded person that they respect other people um, and that they are polite. Um but I guess, you know, it's just a constant negotiation of what is and isn't respectful and what does and doesn't constitute politeness. Was there a particular incident or experience that made you go, I'm going to start paying more attention to this? I'm going to start involving myself in politics more? Because as someone who started doing, you did the Class Clowns program, did mm-hmm. you? And mm-hmm. then you did presumably Raw. Mm-hmm. And you started, I mean, when did you start? You were like 16 or 17 or something? 14. It's so fucking painful (laughs) doing this show and feeling myself getting older and older as the people I talk to, the people who are interesting and exciting and and passionate about comedy, start revealing, oh, well, I've been doing this since I was four weeks old. No, it's it's so painful. But, you know, there are plenty of people, I guess, who, um, no, I'm not going to be prescriptive about this. Talk to me about who you were as a comedian, and if you're doing comedy on stage, I don't care if you're 14, you're a 14 year old comedian. Good no, for you. no, Talk to me I about... disagree strongly. <laughs> no, yeah, but you're just being kind of uh, uh, strategic there, I think. You're being diplomatic. You were, when you were 14, you were like, you must have been. I'm, I'm a, a comedian. comedian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really well, you would... earned that. You stood on stage, you told jokes, you earned it. I did. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I was, I wanted to be an actor. That's, that was the thing. I, I, when I was eight years old, I did a musical and I had this sort of leady role and I got a huge laugh in that, in that show. And that was like it. And I, well, I thought that's what acting was. I guess I eventually realized that the laugh was what I really liked, but I was like theater, acting, performing, everything else in my life is, you know, subservient to that. Friends, family, they'll, they could all, they're all obstacles in the way of me achieving the dream of being <laughs> the greatest actor of my generation. That is some Jimmy Carr NLP thinking for an eight year old. <laughs> um, so, and, and so, you know, I just, the Class Clowns, which is a high school comedy competition, came up and it was just like, oh, this is another chance for me to be on stage. Stage time is good because that will help me when I go to NIDA. Uh, which is the acting school in Sydney. Um, so, I, yes, and then I did it. And then I, I think I realized doing the first class clowns thing where you have a workshop with a professional comedian and then you do a show in front of other young like like high school students. 
I was like, man, I'm the only one on stage. Everyone's looking and listening to me. And when it goes well, everyone laughs and I get the glory of that. So I think that was kind of um, getting addicted to that. I, it's hard for me to remember any of the material. I think it was very much poo based, um, some genital stuff, uh, a story about going to the toilet comes to mind, like an automatic toilet. I mean, I'm just thinking back to the script of your show from two nights ago. <laughs> there's some, there's some poo based genital stuff in there. I mean, you combine those. Co- do you think it's layered admirably. now? And it's yeah. more, you know, it's actually a political comment on the human condition. So it's better now. <laughs> yeah. Annoyingly it is. It really is. <laughs> um, you well, sorry, let's, let's just let's pursue this line for a moment. So you, what you're describing there, albeit maybe in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, is the kind of megalomania of a teenager going, this is, this is my dream, this is my passion, I'm going to be huge at this. You know, that yeah. me- megalomania is clearly the wrong word, but that kind of passion and excitement and, and having something completely occupy your entire worldview. This mm. is me. I was kind of shy in every other aspect of my life because I was a bit chubby, wasn't good at sport. Probably 14, 15, you got some old homosexual thoughts kicking around up there. Um, so that doesn't feel good. Um, and uh, so, yes, I just threw myself into study and like acting was the thing I was good at and maybe leaning into that and being on stage was like, you know, that was some kind of release or some kind of um, uh, <laughs> a revelation of the real me. I don't know. I just very awkward and worried what other people think about me in a range of other contexts. So when I went on stage, the one thing that I kind of had there was confidence in that, I guess. Does that make sense? I, 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 I think I had the attitude of if I was going on stage, you could either do it half assed and it would be shit and you would be embarrassed or you could just commit 100% and it would become, you know, the best version of, of that. And older comedians have told me that the thing that they thought I had, regardless of quality of material or insight or anything like that, was sort of just this uh, brazen confidence. I was doing like public speaking competitions as well and debating and, and all that kind of nonsense. And where does that brazen confidence come from? Well, probably privilege. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what you described there is not is not an unhappy kid desperate to find a an outlet. Is no. it so much as kind of a, a fairly well adjusted kind of a kid going? Oh, I'm a bit shy. Actually, yeah, I could be doing this. Were you supported by your parents? Yeah, loved it. My, like, mum suggested I audition for that musical when I was a kid, and as soon, when it became clear, <laughs> I've had some thoughts about you, Tom. <laughs> Maybe you'd be happy auditioning for a musical. Stop wearing my shoes, and let's. <laughs> I don't want my mum's shoes, um, but uh, yes, no, they were, and, and it was very clear. And my dad is like. Um, uh, quite a uh, sporty kind of guy. I don't think he would describe himself previously as like a huge fan of the theater or whatever. But when I started getting involved with musical theater groups and my brother did as well, he just like threw himself in a hundred percent, joined the committee, went to working bees to build sets, you know, would come see me do public speaking competitions and would tell me that I was better than everybody else there. And like, just, just, you know, beautifully, um, Male, uh, very supportive way. Yeah, they really. That is really excellent. And what that personally throws up for me is that me and my partner have a running joke about the fact that if our baby grows up and is into accountancy or football, that's what you have to do. You have to get the fuck into football. Whereas she's like, he can be gay. I don't mind. I'm like, you. What do you mean you don't mind? You would absolutely (laughs) love that. The test for you is going to be whether or not you can cope with him being really into some tedious sport that you hate. You know. The ultimate one for that is that there was a um, gay website in Australia that listed its like uh, uh, 30 most influential queer Australians. And uh, I was on the list and my ex-boyfriend was on the list as well, who has a public profile. And I told my parents that and my dad asked if I was ranked higher than him. I'm like, Dad, it's not a list, okay? It's just, it's not like a ranked list. There's okay. just 30 people. It's not a competition. We're all big influential queers great. out well, there. You, what, you mean that, that, that that's his kind of sporting? That, exactly, like, yeah. Oh, did you beat him? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. I love it. <laughs> Those lists are always ranked. Everyone's got a number. No, it's just a list of people. There's not a top one. It's just well, like, did they have numbers? They just like here are thirty influential people. In what order? Oh my <laughs> fucking <it, laughs> hell! Like, you are a dad now. Yeah. 
So this is Tom. Uh, he's got. He, he's not normally as nasal as this. He, I think, he had a bit of a cold at the time. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. I think this is a very good, uh, uh, good episode. I, in fact, on the subject of voices not being great, you'll hear mine is a little bit raspy because I've just concluded uh, the final week of shows at, at Soho uh, compared to what is now finished. It's done and dusted. If you missed it, I will at some point make available, probably for a small amount of money, uh, a recording of the uh, the show that we recorded in in Bristol halfway through the run. It was a particularly good show and uh, I'm glad to have a version of that, which I will eventually get round to mastering and editing and all the rest of it and making it sound all pucker. So uh, thank you to everyone that uh, came along to the Soho shows and the tour in general. That's it. It's finished. I can't believe it's over. I've never done a show that many times, 90 something times. Um, and uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. I'm very, very grateful to everyone that came along to see it and said such nice things about it to me afterwards and on the Comedians Comedian Facebook group and on my own fan page and on all forms of social media and to all other humans. And a special mention has got to go to the two people on the tour, uh, a guy called Graham in London who saw me uh, supporting Jack Whitehall at Wembley and brought 10 people with him to Soho. And uh, I, I suspect actually Graham's wife also played a part in that, uh, although Graham was very happy happy to loudly take the credit for it um, but also someone whose name I, I'm afraid I don't remember they emailed me I've got it I could dig it out somewhere um, who came along and saw me in Crawley and again they'd seen me last year and then came back and brought 10 friends guys let's just keep doing that every year right that's the new <laughs> that's the new rule uh, come along if you enjoy the show next time 10 mates I think that works that works for everybody and uh, and you get to be the cool guy that introduced all of these friends to my stuff so um, a little bit more or oh, quite a lot more from Tom coming up uh, and then I'll chat to you for a little bit afterwards uh, The by the time this goes out I would have concluded the uh, the last uh, live Soho podcast with Joe Brand can't wait for, for that uh, it's going to be happening uh, in just a few hours from now but I think um, by the time you hear this that will be done uh, and then uh, that's it for all of the stuff I'm doing apart from the Edinburgh Festival and the, the cranking up of the new live show which I'm happy to officially announce is called Like I Mean It and will be at 3.45 at the Liquid Rooms Annex in Edinburgh, which is where I was last year. It's a free show, but do bring money. More on that uh, to come over the next few weeks and months. Got some terrific episodes for you. Now in the can, we have Simon Munnery, Barry Cryer, Pippa Evans, as well as some uh, some exciting foreigners. We have uh, Nick Cody and Anne Edmonds from Australia, Orlando Baxter from the USA, uh, and also Ivan Aristagueta from Venezuela. So uh, lots of uh, great episodes coming coming your way very soon. Keep it com com. And uh, if you're enjoying the show, you can, of course, donate at comedianscomedian.com forward slash donate. You can join the tens of people uh, who are uh, making little monthly subscriptions to, to pay uh, the show a couple of quid a week, and a couple of quid a month. I mean, a couple of quid a week. One or two people are doing that. So I'm profoundly grateful. Um, but more usual is a pound or two or five pounds a month if you are valuing the show, uh, if it is causing you to feel excited about comedy if it's introducing new things to you then uh, like those subscription payment Netflix type uh, services why not make a donation to this show that is uh, that happens in a regular way a couple of quid a month you wouldn't notice makes a huge difference to me a little something this end to keep the lights on and uh, you can also go to Patreon if you're a Patreon person you can go to uh, Patreon slash ComComPod uh, and you can also give me a little confusingly electronic <laughs> and uh, futuristic uh, internet payment. Now, with all of these, um, lots of people do things with their podcast and with their payment schemes and stuff such that you get extra content. Now, obviously, I, I, that's difficult for me to do because I, I don't want to interview people and say to them, hey, only the Patreon people or only the subscribers are going to hear this. I want all of you guys to hear all of the stuff. So I did decide a long time ago what I was going to do was simultaneously make all of the stuff available. Yes, perhaps you need to join the mailing list because it's free to do that. Um, so all of the stuff is always available for free, um, and uh, and so I'm not selling any of it. So that's the decision so far, and it's a decision I'm sticking with for the moment because I do like the idea of it. You know me, former streety, and uh, I'm much more interested in that kind of crowd-funded, uh, crowd-sourced payment model. So the plan is those who can afford it pay for those who can't, uh, but everyone gets the stuff. So that's the situation. If you'd like that situation to continue, if that appeals to you, if it uh, if it uh, flicks your switch morally 
morally or ethically or it feels like a good way to do it, uh, then if you can afford to support the show, please do so. You can do a one-off payment as well if you fancy. I get back to everybody that uh, signs up, subscribes, or um, uh, subscribes payment-wise. I can't get back to everyone that subscribes on iTunes. They simply won't give me the data much as I'd like it. Um, But all the one-off donations, all the donations of any sort, I do respond personally to all of those uh, emails. So... um, Uh, I hope that I will be responding to you soon. If you'd like to support the show, please do that. One little email from someone now. This is quite a fun email. And then we'll get back to Tom Ballard, a mystery listener who wishes not to be named. Uh, This really tickled me. He says, hi, Stuart. Quite by chance, I hit upon ComComPod in June last year. Shappy Corsandy, I think it was. I have a weird love-hate relationship with the podcast. You have my full attention, mystery listener. Uh, He goes on to say, I used to muck about a lot on stage doing comedy sketches at university and a few of my then peers have gone on to do rather well. And he mentions people like uh, Richard Ayoade, John Oliver, Spencer Brown, that kind of crowd. And he goes on, listening to the podcast allows me to live vicariously for an hour or so. But it also makes me think I should be doing something, even though with what I think is a level head, it's just plain crazy at this stage in my life. Then there's that word should. I get the feeling you know what I mean there. Good point. This is a a common um, uh, mental health thing. (laughs) A lot of therapies will tell you should statements, you know, telling yourself you should do stuff. It's actually not very useful. You can, you know, you can want to do a thing, but you, you don't need to do a thing because you feel you should do it. That can be very, very damaging. Anyway, he says, I get the feeling you know what they mean there. Anyway, I've just donated to say thank you and to support other listeners who are moved to action. He goes on to recommend a kid's book, I Want My Hat Back by John Classen. Hey, I've not only got uh, I Want My Hat Back, I've also got, uh, uh, I, what's it? Is it I Stole a Hat, the sequel with the fish, uh, and indeed the, the best of the three, I think, uh, We Found a Hat, which is the tortoise's one. And, <laughs> and these will sound utterly facile uh, from the titles if you don't have any knowledge of the, the beautiful incredibly lean, elegant little plots that they have uh, and the wonderful expressive drawings. So I highly recommend all of that. Thanks for the tip. Thanks for the recommendations. And thank you for admitting your weird love-hate relationship with the podcast. Thank you as well to everybody that uh, hashtag Slam Stew uh, got involved with that on Twitter and uh, insulted me with some creative three-word phrases by means of uh, pushing the Edinburgh show. So thank you to all of you. Um, Let's get back now to the fabulous and aggravatingly talented and young Tom Ballard. So, the, we were talking about the if there was a political awakening. So you're someone who, who got on stage and enjoyed it for the, for the joy, like the sensual pleasure of being on stage, making a whole bunch of people laugh, mm. feeling not anxious, feeling not shy, feeling like <coughs> a success. Yeah. Now, there is a route that you can go down, that a lot of comedians go down, of, of kind of going... Well, this is enough. I'm just going to get funnier. Yeah. So did you, what, what was the kind of path that you then trod through those years of becoming more professional? When did you start getting paid? Uh, uh, getting paid? Um, gosh. Well, again, obnoxious, but I came out of high school with sort of work lined up at the radio station Triple J. A guy saw me do my Raw set when I was 16 years old. I was doing community radio with my friend Alex Dyson, and he said, oh, the, the manager of the station said, do you do any radio? We sent them a cassette tape of this horrible radio show that we did. They said, this is horrible, but we like you. Like, you have some kind of chemistry going on. We will take a long time to train you up to turn you into something. So I finished high school. I lived in the country. I moved to Melbourne. I spent a year doing circuit, uh, doing, doing gigs around the circuit. I did the Comedy Zone, the Melbourne Comedy Festival's Comedy Zone, which is like four young who, up and coming. Who was that with? Michael Williams, Celia Pocola. Seals? Seals. No, it wasn't. No, they were the year before me. I tell a lie. Sorry. Uh, no, my year was with Jack Drews, Jacques Barrett, and Lila Tillman. I'm not aware of Jack. He's excellent. Jacques is brilliant. Yes, wonderful. Jack has sort of taken the past couple of years off doing festivals. Lila is not really doing comedy anymore. Okay. Um, but that was amazing. That was really fun. Um, and you were the youngest, presumably, in that? Yes. Uh, no, Jack was younger than me. Really? So I hated him with every fibre of my being. Really? Because <laughs> I've seen him recently and he's got a big grey moustache. Jack and... Drews. Oh, Jack Drews. Jack Drews, sorry, yes, Jack Drews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're not... <laughs> oh, you're one of those Michael <laughs> J. Fox like wizard shit. man boys. <laughs> I was thinking, this didn't happen in the 90s, he said cassette. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I mean, sort of charmed life. In terms Very of like the yes, entertainment industry. Obnoxiously so, yes. So lucky I'm break after a spark lucky break. of promise yeah. then offered me training and opportunity. But I, I mean, I always say that I am kind of this this sort of like um, 
in terms of the Melbourne Comedy Festival point of view, I am the the quintessential nurtured story where I did class clowns, high school competition, raw comedy, the adult open mic, went into comedy zone, and then uh, my first solo show, I, I got the newcomer thing. So you, you know, got the award. You got the, the, the award. Yeah, yeah. Um, which let me yeah go to and travel to Edinburgh just to look at it and, and check it out and go, wow, that's pretty amazing. So it's like yeah, in terms of. Uh, you know, if you want evidence that that festival does breed new talent and encourages people to get into the industry and supports them through that, then yes, I absolutely am that. Yeah, it's weird because that is not a thing that I associate with the UK comedy scene. Right. I'm sure some people would disagree. There are certainly competitions which I don't know if the con- if the competitions in the UK are set up to nurture new talent, right? So much as to, and right. I'm going to be slightly controversial here, so much as to fulfill their own remit and employ the people involved in creating them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think in the UK there are... I certainly don't have a sense that figures... in There are individual nice people, Mm. some of them involved in some of the competitions, who want the best for people. But there isn't a sense of... I don't think there's an equivalent of class clowns. There's not like, right, we're priming you for the next step, for the next step, for the next step. So that is really exciting to go, oh, you're, you're kind of a... Oh, sorry, this is from the Comedy Festival. The Comedy Festival runs all these programs and they, it receives government money in some way. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, does act, it has a remit too. Um, yeah, it is a slightly different vibe, which, whereas, you know, Edinburgh is like this just fucking insane industry yeah. swarm where people are, you know, making and breaking careers all the time. Um, but Melbourne, there's no one at the centre of that saying, no, oh, part of our job is, yes. to, is to nurture new talent and give people opportunities. Yes. Those are sort of byproducts of trying to get up there and make yeah. money. <laughs> and with the government funding comes like an obligation to in- involve indigenous people, so they're deadly funny, you know, like um, regional, getting stuff out regional, so sending the Comedy Festival Roadshow to regional areas and getting kids in regional areas like I was to get involved in the Class Clowns competition, like you do your heats nearby and then you come into the city. So there are these obligations to, to make comedy more accessible for more people. And I think that is that is a wonderful thing. I think that's one of the best parts of the, about the Melbourne Comedy Festival. So you are the kind of poster boy for that system working because sure. it worked really well, you won the stuff. Does that mean that you are now... Oh, does that mean that you are now somehow... Do you owe anything to the festival? Are you kind of like... <laughs> do, they, do they own your ass in a kind of a world? So is anyone shadowy in the background going, Tom, you must now become the... I don't know what... <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh, I don't think there's any, you know, well, no, I mean, the payback is me proving that they're doing their job. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I've done favours for the festival every now and again. You say yes when Susan tells you to jump. You, you say how high. Um, but normally you're paid for those things. So maybe it's not really. I don't, I don't, <laughs> exactly. I, I've received even more opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> hey, opportunities. Done them a few favours. Couple of corporates. Okay. I think, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. You know, people will inevitably and eternally complain about any arts festival ever, um, and particularly, you know, jaded, bitter, twisted artists. But I think generally the feeling in Australia is that, you know, the Melbourne Comedy Festival is pretty extraordinary um, and it does a pretty amazing job of, of making a lot of stuff happen for a lot of people. Yeah. So just to follow, I suppose what I'm getting at is that as someone who just kind of nailed it straight out of the gate. And, I, you know, obviously there were tough gigs along the way, sure. I, I hope. Um, but uh, <laughs> I hope you had the good grace to die in your arms a few times. Absolutely. Oh, God, yes. So what, but it was what, also, like, shitty. Like, you know, I, I, I could perform perfectly well, but, you know, what was I saying? Was I figuring out my voice? Was I just aping, you know, Bill Hicks or Louis C.K. or Pat Oswald, who I was obsessed with? You know, was I just sort of I'm regurgitating? Really glad, I'm stuff? really glad you mentioned Pat because I was trying to... I was trying to on the way over here I was thinking how am I going to bring up the, <laughs> the bits of pattern that I reckon uh, not but... bits not material but phraseology you do yes. a you do a uh, your voice of a sort of an English lord character yes. is a little bit like pattern yes. one and also you use the word hoo-ha for vagina and that is straight off werewolves and lollipops I'm going to put my kids in your hoo-ha <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't own it but literally no one else has said it in a century <laughs> that is probably where that's from no 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 but like, that's, that's absolutely fine I don't mean that to sound critical it's a tribute at all. <laughs> yeah but uh, honestly I know absolutely I was watching that <coughs> thinking this is lovely yeah. Tom's into the same stuff as I am and you know, you right. know I don't mean I'm, you know, I'm teasing no I totally know what you mean I mean yeah I, I could identify yeah, a bunch of other people I, but it does feel like this show and every year at least to me it feels like there is bigger swaths of the show that are me being funny in the way that I want to be funny that is closer to how I am funny around my friends. Like, I feel like that is that is a process that's getting there. 
and there are more jokes that aren't funny on paper, but when I say them in my certain way, they do they do really work, you know. So, I, so I, yeah, that's that's what I really like about this new show, actually. <clears throat> yeah. So, the point at which I've been hovering around the bit where I it, smash a watermelon, you know. I mean. <laughs> You're um, someone in your position could have just been satisfied with being funny. And you have grown a social conscience. And I, you know, I don't, you know, you've grown, you've financial gain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I ran out. I, I, I ran out of stuff that, that I thought made a great show or became particularly interesting to me. And my, my brain and my life just started leaning towards thinking about. Uh, politics and my opinions on things and that's what I was reading about, that's what I was obsessed about, that was kind of what the things that that, that, that inspired me to think of jokes and think of or, or even just reading something being like I want to talk about this on stage, not I don't have a joke for this yet but this is something messed up in the world that I want to try and exercise by, by, by talking about it on stage. And, and you, when you say you ran out, that's really interesting because if you're only 27, and I think that's a fear that everyone has, any anecdotalist, mm. anyone who's like, oh, this funny thing happened to me, mm. as opposed to someone like Nick Cody, who, I don't know, this came up in my interview with him, you know, it, it's like a, a review of him said, oh, you can imagine he's going to make a lifetime of bad choices, he's going to give him new material, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's some people like that. Yeah. But I think for a lot of comics... You know, you're like, oh, God, I hope something happens. I've used up every story from my childhood. You yeah. know, there, there is, I don't think it's necessarily a valid artistic concern that should bother anyone. Right. But there is certainly, you know what I mean? There's that fear of like, oh, what happens when you, if and when you run out? Right. So to me, so is that is that what you mean? That idea that you're like, you've done all the funny stuff you can think of. You've done all your toilet jokes and all your airplane jokes yes. and all your, well, that's all that. No, I'm young, not a huge amount. I can't do yeah. baby stuff yet. Can't do, you know, marriage. <laughs> Legally prevented from doing marriage material. Which, kind of, which still blows my mind. As it should be, yes. Yeah. Um, like, it blows my mind. I'm not just being uh, super PC there, but it blows my mind that I didn't fucking know until this trip Either that you know, couldn't yeah. get married in Australia if you were a deviant. Mind-blowing. Um, so... Yeah, I did a show about coming out. I did a show about heartbreak. I did a show about a family holiday. <laughs> you're, sna- like, you're smiling at that. Is that was that you going? Oh shit! I'm uh, gonna do a, I guess I'm doing the family holiday yes, show. Yes, yeah. I think it had. It could have been a good show. I do. I, yeah, it was mediocre that show. It could have been good, and I couldn't couldn't do the refugee lecture now without having done that show because that had like slideshows and working with a projector and learning about that and telling a story kind of thing. So I learned a lot doing that show. And I started doing refugee material in that show. It was about a family holiday driving around Australia, but also what is Australia and what is national identity? It could have been good. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I did that. And, what, and why wasn't it good? Because you weren't good enough to do it well yet. Or yeah, because... I think so. Yeah, I don't think the jokes were up, up to scratch. I think I was, um, you know, sacrificing. Well, I have to talk about this bit because it's a part of the story. Um, so these jokes will have to do well. I'm okay. doing this bit as opposed to you know maybe letting the stronger material guide it or just writing better jokes and, and not not accepting certain quality enough uh, as good enough or not. quality control writing editing yeah those are all yeah, yeah all, all of the things yeah <laughs> okay some some incredible insights here on the ballad episode uh, no, no, <laughs> no 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 I, I, I think that is re- that is a really uh, in, that's a great position to be in to look back at something and be able to honestly say to yourself I didn't write well enough, mm. I didn't write hard enough, I didn't edit deftly enough, and there were other <laughs> huge yeah. flaws with it. I certainly have a... My second show was about my anxiety, and it just became a vortex, because every time I tried to write about my anxiety, I was suffering very badly at the time, and I would become very anxious, and oh. the entire process was incredibly painful and torturous. And uh, it's really nice to look back on that and go, I learned from that, and mm. now I spot myself writing things, and go, up, 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 this, we're going down the rabbit hole now, forget it. Right. So you ran out of stuff and you started, you ran out of kind of casual, you know, mm. what Gordon Southern Charmini calls walking around jokes. <laughs> and these, are just my, <laughs> these are just my walking around jokes. I love that phrase. But um, you run out of those kind of go-to things. Mm. And so you started to write more about things that directly concerned you, that, that kind of you were more passionate about, that you, more cared, that you cared about politically. Now, you mentioned in, in your show here, Problematic, which you are taking to Edinburgh. So mm-hmm. I hope listeners to this, if they go to Edinburgh, will see it. I... Um, I heard you doing that stuff about being a passing, you have passing privilege. Mm. As a gay man, mm. you don't necessarily look or like, you know, you're not camp, you don't necessarily fulfill a lot of the public stereotypes of what a gay person looks like. Mm. So, 
was there, I'm sort of interested in looking at that from the point of view of whether you were passionate to talk about political things because of an experience you personally were having, whether you were the victim of abuse. I mean, it's fascinating to hear that element of your show whereby you're saying, hey, look, everyone says being gay is really tough, but I found it kind of easy. I, I thought that was an absolutely delight. That's, that's, you know, it's like when a comic admits to having been a bully rather than being bullied. I'm not saying it's, right. it's anything parallel to that. I'm, I'm saying that the analogy is, is simply that, well, that is a, that's a perspective that normally no one would bother saying because the right. instinct of a comedian would be to play up the tough stuff right. rather than relish. Well, I have played up the tough stuff in previous shows. Okay. <laughs> in fact... My show t- two years ago, uh, Taxis and Rainbows and Hatred, was an hour on homophobia. But it was an hour on on small moments of homophobia. So, yeah, I mean, look, I just, I can't say that I'm, you know, the language of oppression is difficult for me, I think. I think I'm I'm taking the piss a bit if I say I'm, a, I'm oppressed. I think there's structural homophobia that affects queer people like, like myself. Um, but generally, and I'm very lucky for this, have got through the experience pretty well and have emerged you know after coming out you know loving my life and, and embracing the fact that I'm gay not just surviving with it but actually you know loving it and not being able to sort of imagine my life any other way you know I think when you first come out you're like well I'm gay but I'll deal with it now it's like no no I love being gay and I actually view it as a fundamental and positive part of my life <laughs> as opposed to you know something to deal with but it attacks of rainbows and hatred was like this story of me having getting into a taxi with a homophobic taxi driver and that sort of framing a story of uh, an hour of story of stories of small moments of homophobia that kind of just chip away at you this kind of death by a thousand cuts idea so you know at a music festival I asked a guy watching a band oh do you like these guys and he turned to me and said no I'm fucking married because he thought I said do you uh do you like guys that was how I cracked onto it. Um, you know, other tech, and I, had, I actually had like four other stories of taxi drivers doing fucked up kind of homophobic things. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that show certainly explored that. And that was, and then, you know, also I got angrier because you read about what happens in Uganda. And, you know, yes, the gay marriage debate was still just limping along in my country, which is kind of infuriating. Um, and, yeah, doing that show was a conscious choice of like, uh, I, I want to talk about this. I, I t- I've talked about my sexuality a lot in the past, but I don't want to stop talking about it because I feel pressured to. If I'm interested in it and I think there's comedy here, I should talk about it because homophobia is still totally a thing. And it shouldn't be old hat to talk about this stuff because these experiences are still happening to me and lots of other people in the, in the world. Um, so were you yes. satisfied with that show? Did that show achieve the things you set out to achieve? It really was, actually. Yeah, I loved that show. I It didn't quite... I guess I thought when I did it in Melbourne in 2015, I thought, man, this is a real... This is this could be a thing. Uh, and it wasn't. Uh, when you say it could be a thing, oh do you God. mean it could be a war nominee? Yes. You can fit... Come on, this is a, this is a safe space, Tom. We all yes. want to fucking win a thing. Well... We shouldn't want to, though. No, we shouldn't, but we do. <laughs> and I think it's, 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 it, that, that is similarly analogous to saying, hey, I've had a, a comparatively easy ride of coming out yes, these days. Yes, yes. You know, it's interesting because it's true. And look, it, if that's the truth, if you thought, hey, this, this one, this could be the award, yes. then that's interesting because yes. you, you're presumably, you cannot help, I mean, as any of us cannot help it, but you as someone who has won things previously... Mm. Presumably, part of that experience conditions you to go. Well, I guess presumably at some point I win a big thing. I know, I know, but you just we we just cannot we cannot place artistic um, affirmation on those things. And again, but we do. Uh, well, we do. Well, well let's we do. Come on, you're an honest guy. Let's have it. We don't talk about this much on the show, but I think you're the guy to do it. And right. I don't think you're going to come across as like, oh, have you heard the Tom Ballard episode? It's really got bigger to myself. <laughs> Can't wait to win. But let's let's so talk funny, about that. Like, because David Nody thinks I'm obsessed with awards, and he he talks to me about it all the time, and it makes me really upset. Well, he wouldn't do that unless he was your friend. Was, he thought he was some truth. Find it funny. Totally yeah, exactly. And there's some truth in it. So what? Would it? I, it is. It is the goody boy uh, in me. It is the um, I want an A plus. I want uh, a t- the teacher's pet in me. Right. This idea that um, I need someone to validate the thing outside by giving it an official stamp. Or uh, you know, I remember I got a C plus in high school at one point. And my dad got angry at me, <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, that's wrong. Or like, I've got to be the best at the thing, otherwise I've I've wasted. It. I still think of Mark Watson's episode of the show where he says. 
you know, if you work at Oxfam or whatever and you're the 40th best person, you're still working at Oxfam. But in comedy, it's such a fucking stupid job. You, you should be in the top 10. <laughs> Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Yeah. So, but I think I'm getting better. And, you know, again, uh, coming from a place that, uh, yes, I have won some awards for stuff. But, like, you know, this year I wasn't nominated in Melbourne. I was really happy with my show. I had some people said some good things and said fucked up stuff like, oh, you could be nominated or whatever. And that gets in your head. And then you're like, well, I can't, I cannot judge this artistically or I shouldn't feel differently about it uh, artistically because uh, the show is no different. And just because a group of people did not necessarily count it as their favourite shows at the festival, that's that's meaningless to whether or not it's any good. Isn't it odd? Isn't it double think to go, I absolutely am firm, my conviction is yes. awards are meaningless. Yes. God, I want one. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Well, it's all. I, I do think I've also gotten to a point where I'm like, I, I do try and view them as uh, opportunity makers and, you know, as an economic reality or just a fact of like, well, that will help me sell tickets in there sure. and what have you to have that behind it. Yeah, it's not unreasonable to want an additional means of selling hundreds of tickets. Sure. If, if it, if it, and, and also, you know, more, more tickets or more credibility as an artist gives you more freedom, gives you more legitimacy when you're pitching other things, you know, like you do kind of build momentum to to further doing other work you want to do. And I guess there's a thing where it's like, well, I was nominated last year, so have I gone backwards? Is the show not as good? If you get nominated, should, should you then get nominated oh, the for every year? Random thing, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh my God, nominated one year, didn't win the next year. Well, I guess I'm worse now. Jesus. And I think, well, and as you what said, a- you know, I think this show's better than the one yeah, last year. Yeah, I so. Anyway, it's it's so dumb and such a silly uh, thing to have in your head, but you know I, I do think it's so. On the day the nominations festivals. came out this year, did you have a moment? Or did you check the thing? Did you expect to get a text you didn't get? What was the? I was at a drinks with my management um, and a bunch of other people who were managed by the same company all got nominated, and I was so happy for all of them. And um, I had only seen I think one of the shows that were nominated at that point and stuff, and you just you know. I mean, it's it's ridiculous because I've spent much more of my life not being nominated for awards than I have been <laughs> nominated, so I should be used to it. But um, uh, yeah, we, it was just that thing of like, oh, okay, I thought I I thought I'd sort of stepped up a bit since last year's show, but according to the judges of the panel this year, apparently, then that's not necessarily the case. That's ridiculous, isn't that silly? See, it's what I think you need to work on. I think I think I want to anyway work on it to move away from that. And you know, the ultimate example is Daniel Kitson. Of, of someone rejecting all the trappings of that nonsense for the sake of making the work that he's proud of and um, trying to remove the ego out of it as much as he possibly can in this line of work. I think that's a good way to be, you know? So all I had was sort of my opinions. That was what I was left with, uh, was, was what I think about stuff as opposed to any kind of great uh, story or personal uh, sharing. So, and in 2012, I did a show called Doing Stuff, which was me trying to do a political show, and that did not work because it was uh, heavy on the preaching, not so much on the jokes. What's your or, metric of whether or not that worked? Was it number of laughs in the room? Was it critical response? Just, if, just you can feel, feel it. Tummy. You know, yeah, 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 you're doing a festival running like this isn't this isn't what I want it to be. Um, yeah, it would still, I mean, again, not to complain, but the downside to getting into comedy very early and sort of having a bit of success early on is that, you know, you, you, your, your failures are pretty public and, and you sort of, you know, my profile was, there was certainly a point where my profile was above my skill level as a comic. So I was doing a National Breakfast Radio show and doing this, you know, five or six out of ten stand-up comedy show that wasn't, you know, I was getting people to come to see the show and I still was trying to figure out what the fuck I was about and what my stand-up was. You know what I mean? So, yeah, the journey to find one's voice um, has sort of taken a long time and that has happened in front of sort of more people than it maybe should have. <laughs> but then I'm sure it happens know, to everyone. It's but nice to have a profile. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. How can you complain about it? But... And, you know, every mistake makes you the better comic and you learn from it and stuff. But, um, yeah, I just think about the fact that, uh, yeah, there were certainly better comics than me doing shows to um, uh, smaller crowds, you know. Are you humble in comedy? 
I, well, I think being, not being arrogant is good. I try not to be arrogant. Um, I may well come across that way sometimes. Sometimes I play the character of an arrogant person, either on stage or in my, yeah. It, Personal life. <laughs> in a room on my own <laughs> whilst writing angry emails. <laughs> As a joke. I mean... You know, it's funny, we did the roast of Dilruk Jai singing last yes. week uh, with, with these guys. I was very podcast. sorry not to see that. I liked Dil very much. It was a joy. It was really good. And so one of the big jokes of me was like me doing shows for refugees and banging on preaching into people and, oh, how brave you're talking to a left-wing comedy festival audience about being nice to refugees and you're clearly self-aggrandizing. You know, that was the joke. That was the angle for a bunch of um, jokes. So, you know, you just wear that because it's like, well, of course, that's that's reasonable criticism. I'm not going to stop doing the shows, but yeah, that's funny that everyone thinks that's the thing about me. So, you, I mean, you, you and you talked about this in, in the show, in Problematic, you talk about the, the difficulty of the, you know, give us a cheer if you're right wing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are you just <laughs> preaching to the choir? And if you are, even, even as you say, I mean, I, as I'm saying, I, I agree in completely that it is a really interesting, valid, relevant show in which you do confess your own privilege and the problems with that, and you talk about, you know, the difficulties with language whereby you do like to laugh at, at jokes that contain elements of bile or spite or, yep. you know, there are, there are funny stuff in there. There is some, some really fun analysis of, of comedy itself in that show that I, I think listeners to this podcast would really enjoy. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not changing the minds of anyone, really, in the audience because yep. they're left-wing festival audiences mm. are you threatening to take that show on tour to remote places where people are threatening <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, if, and if you are would anyone come and see it will, will anyone come and see you whose mind is up for being changed or I mean have you considered any kind of like guerrilla approach where you trick people who are right wing into uh, coming to see you and change their minds what, what is there any solution well, for problematic, no. I actually, I actually, well, I actually think there are parts of problematic that need to be said in the bubble because that you know there's some parts of that show that are like, guys, some parts of political correctness is messed up, and I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how many extreme PC social justice warriors are coming to my show. They're probably you know generally left wing people. I'm, I'm just going to pause because I'm just I'm, you know how quickly the discourse moves these days. Yes, I'm in the last year. I've noticed that social justice warriors, SJWs, yes. was exclusively a term used by wankers online yes. to prick the their perceived pomposity of anyone trying to yes. be no, I hate, I mean, political I hate, correct. And, and yet, no, it's not just you doing yeah. it now. It's social justice warriors is almost like interchangeable with those people who are, like what it means is kind of almost elite progressives, people for whom no language is good enough yes. and no discourse is fast enough to keep up with their ideals. And it's weird to hear the left using... And like I say, it's not just you using it. It's weird for me to hear the left using terms like SJWs yeah. as a as a means of identifying that. It's almost like, oh, what have we have we appropriated the term yeah. SJWs or not? <laughs> We're not reclaimed. Yeah. Well, some people, you know, wear it as a badge of honour. I wrote an article for the Guardian, and I had social justice warriors in there, and the editor was like, "Do you really want to do this?" Because the alt right uses this term often in a very blatantly racist way. Or, or a really misogynist way, you know, as well. There's kind of like any yeah, woman so kind who, of... who speaks up for her own rights as a social justice warrior. Yeah, so I probably shouldn't use it. It is, it is sort of part of the lexicon of this debate. And when I say social justice warrior, I guess I mean the most extreme, humorless, um, blunt-edged approach to social change that some people adopt online. I mean, I would say, I mean, I really care about social justice and I'm fully, and I'm fully on there. I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. We're feeding into the, the rhetoric of the opposition when, when you use that kind of term. But anyway, I'm, I'm not sure how many like super 100% deep, uh, almost religious, politically correct people are coming to my show. Maybe they, maybe they, they're not. Um, but generally, you know, decent left wing people, uh, who would subscribe to political correctness, could be in the audience, and I, you know, I do want to stay on that stage and say there are some moments when saying really fucked up stuff is funny, and comedy is a special case. But also, racism and homophobia, transphobia are awful, and I'm trying to figure out some kind of middle ground there. So, but the problematic show, I mean, it's it's yes, it's very much sort of up its own ass, and we'll do fine in comedy festivals. My show, Boundless Plains to Share, which is about Australia's treatment of refugees. You said that very quickly then. Boundless Plains to Share. To Share, which is a line from the uh, national anthem in Australia. For those who come across the seas with Boundless Plains to Share, 
ironic because we lock people up who come here across the seas. Um, I mean, that is a show that is very explicitly with a political agenda and is really specifically talking about a specific uh, political issue that I want to change and I want to mobilise people to um, do more to try to change. There are heaps of people doing so much more work than I ever will, but in, in my realm of comedy, if I can remind audiences how fucked up that is, then, then yes. But the overwhelming feedback I get from it from, is people coming along going, this show is great, we're all aboard already. You, you know, we've got to get this yeah. into regional What's areas. conversion rate? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and, and I do think there's probably another version of the show I could do that is a bit more sort of olive branchy, that it says to right-wing people, you know, starting at, say, patriotism, saying, I love this country too. I feel so lucky to be an Australian. I, here's all the great things about Australia. This is great. We can all connect on this. Therefore, the way we're treating refugees is actually undermining how great Australia is and can be, as opposed to the current version, which is me literally starting with how shit is our national anthem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's just, that just before you got into that, that kind of almost the penultimate sentence you said about... This is how great, what was it? This is how great our country is, and it's to the detriment of how great our country is and how proud we should be mm. that we treat immigrants like this. Yeah. I thought, I mean, yeah, that seems like a. Is this, the, is this the sort of the next wave of left wing discourse? Is having to become, if not, well, like you said, olive branch, to become, if not centrist, then, it, well, maybe centrist. Maybe to, centrist. To, yeah. to have to say, look, I believe in all of these ideals, but I've got to meet you halfway. Yeah. And is that then problematic because no one on the right is thinking, well, we've got to meet these lefties halfway. Do we just then end up being drawn further to the right? Mate, fucking tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is like, my every episode of my podcast is basically landing on this question now. But I talked to Finn Taylor about this and he's like, I mean, you're, just, you're not going to bring these people with you if you're saying the West is evil and white people are evil and this everything this country does and stands for and will ever do is evil. Um it's just not a winning no, right or wrong it's just not a winning narrative that doesn't invite people in necessarily and if we do accept that there are decent people who care about other people and want the country to be better who voted for Brexit and voted for Hanson and voted for Trump if we believe that those people are out there um, what are you going to do to to bring them back into your side um, constantly yelling at them and telling them they are racist and evil is, is just not going to do that now, whether all the left just gets a shit together and gets better organised and we just win is another option. I, I, I don't know. But I can certainly see why, you know, a way, just a basic way to connect with people on the right is just this basic level of, you know, of, of patriotism, which I think the left feels. Like, I think everyone on my side of politics does love Australia. Like, a lot, like it, it feels extremely fortunate to be here. But we sort of think that's a given and focus on all the horrible stuff because <laughs> that's what we want to change, you know. Whereas conservatives, by their nature, want to conserve and value traditional things that have served us well for a long time. So, you know, military history, um, our institutions, you know, the, and, and are suspicious of radical change. That's just the basic of the, 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 the um, genesis of the conservative outlook and stuff. Anyway. So... Is there a is there some sort of trick comedy show to be written? Do you know what I mean? Is there, what is there? What other like what other kind of? I, I can say like a forty five minute version of that show that I would pitch to like meetings of the young liberals or a free think. Tank. Now liberals mean something different. Uh, yes, yeah. liberals is the conservative party. Okay, I was like, well, that's not going to solve the problem. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> isn't that weird? Nightmare. Yeah. Um, so yes, and and you know, I would pitch it to people. Say, I'll come do the show for you for free. I'll say, hey guys. Here's what I have learned reading about this topic. Here's why I am really upset and scared and sad and, and why I think this is wrong and we should change. And having a Q&A at the end where I genuinely want to, want to hear other people and listen to them and we can talk it out and try and figure out some kind of... I don't know. Look, this is... An, an idea bubble I had once that I probably won't do, but... I mean, I, I'm endlessly inspired by people like Mark Thomas and Josie Long and Rod Quantock politically active comedians who do the fucking work and, and you know, sacrifice time and potentially career opportunities to dedicate time and energy into actual political activism, not just talking about how bad conservatives are on stage, but actually following that up, you know. So let's talk about the writing of this show. Now, we've seen the script mm. carefully laid out on the desk uh, yeah. with some highlighted pen and some biro notes in the margin. It's very much like what a script would look like if someone needed to fake up a script. 
<laughs> you know there's exercises at school you have to show you working out yeah, yeah this, this is, is the thing this looks but, like comedy you know, doesn't it let's give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that this is a real artifact <laughs> yes I mean it's you're a very good comedy writer you know you have taken some really difficult problematic uh, ideas and you have sold the shit out of them you've sold them well you've pulled them apart you've found the funny in them and you how do you feel about it do you feel this is you at the pinnacle of your current writing practice is this the best work you're capable of doing at the moment um oh that second way i put that sounded really negative uh, I mean, it's all, but is, is this, this is this the best you could is do? this your best stuff currently where are we in your uh, writing? I, I think so i'm not i i, I mean uh, right now having finished the melbourne comedy festival coming up on the end of the comedy festival i will have done this show 40 or 50 times around this I've, uh, after Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane and, and now Melbourne and I'm still really enjoying it I'm not sick of it yet I'm finding new things to it I'm changing bits and pieces a little bit of order stuff taglines new ways of going about it it'll change again before it comes to Edinburgh um, and I did a week of work in progress shows in Perth right at the start of it which was like literally sheets of paper I had too much material and was constantly just swapping in and out stuff and just you know it was actually quite an easy process to cull the stuff that wasn't working as well as I thought. When you say sheets of paper, are you typing it and then taking type sheets like that on stage and reading from them? Or what, Some, is, that, what is that? Sometimes like? I did a few free trial shows here in Melbourne with, with uh, producers organised, which is just a group of people. Sometimes people have no idea who the hell I am. They're just people who've taken free tickets. They can be demoralising shows. But in Perth, it was built as a work in progress, cheaper tickets. People knew they would come along to me. It was in the Noodle Palace in a TAFE in Perth. And um, it was just very freeing What's to be it, like. TAFE? TAFE is a, uh, is uh, like a technical office? college. Oh, technical. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. They totally misunderstood. Over the summer, the fringe is put on there. But, you know, like, like Edinburgh is yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. a university, yeah. Um, and that was just extremely um, freeing to be able to pursue ideas and to just take the pressure off a little. It was still a show. There was still the story going on there. But I was swapping in and out material all the time and really being able to play with without the pressure of being like, I've said this is a show and I'm charging people full price. Okay, and is that how you make all your shows now? You sit, like, do you do an initial period of like, right, I'm going to sit down for a week and write the basics and then start doing it on stage? I'm pretty, yeah, deadline-y. I need a deadline. And so when the festival dates are locked in or it's like Christmas, because, yeah, over the Christmas summer holidays when the sun is shining, everyone's having a great time. We're out there. Comedians are just inside banging away trying to figure out something. Uh, to make it work and what do you think are your strongest suits as a writer what elements of this show do you go like and like I said feel free this is the place to say it which bits do you go alright that is a really Tom Bowen <laughs> um I mean I really love doing the stuff at the top about the bubble and because I yeah, which is about yes the show is taking place in the bubble um Right wing people sound like this. Left wing people sound like this. Oh, you like you do noises like I do noises to represent the right wing, and yeah. then the left are like eh. and about you know my uh, contradictory feelings about something like capitalism. You know, ripping apart all my um, hypocrisies about stuff. I, I I love I love that that kind of um, you know. Oh, of course I say that capitalism is evil and no good, but I have an iPhone. I have a MacBook. Um, I still use capitalism to my advantage. And why do you enjoy that bit so much? I enjoy that because I think it is true. Um, it is it is personal, and it is it is the antidote to the shitty comedy show I did before in two thousand twelve. Because it is me recognizing the failures of me as a person and the form of comedy to sort of solve or do anything before I then go on to give my opinion about how we should solve things. So it is a level of self-deprecation comedy that I think is really true and sort of, it's at the top of the show, it's sort of humbling myself going, guys, I, you know, I'm a confused mess of, I don't know what the fuck I'm thinking about. And then proceed to tell you what I'm thinking about. That's good. That does absolutely has that effect of going, Hey, look, I don't have all the answers. Yes. These are the answers. (laughs) (laughs) And you can always, yeah, it's a get out of jail. It's like I said, I don't know what the hell. Yeah. Tom, we took all your suggestions and it still didn't work. Well, it was a disclaimer at the top, wasn't there? Just a comedian. And what elements of your writing are you less satisfied with? Are there are there kind of blocks? Are there are there things you you think to yourself? I'm doing that again. Um, uh, I think that there was some again there were some parts in the show where it's like I want to talk about this, 
And so the, the, the desire to include a discussion of something in the show maybe usurped hilarity. And I'm actually okay with that because I think there is enough good funny stuff in the hour that the, the, the touching on um, examples of political correctness gone too far, I just had to have them in there because I just have to be there, to have to acknowledge the fact that PC can be annoying sometimes. Because, you know, I mean, I do the bit at the start of the show where I ask people to cheer if they don't like political correctness, and plenty of people do. Um, and plenty of, you know, decent, nice, lefty people say they hate political correctness. So there has to be an in for those people in the show for me to acknowledge, like, I know it's ridiculous that a council in Tunbridge Wells banned people from saying brainstorming for fear of offending people with epilepsy. I'm on board with that, guys. But let's not pretend like language doesn't matter to people. That's, that's what PC is about. So there's some bits in there that probably aren't a great... If, if all I was going for was, you know, a grade hilarity 100% of the time, probably wouldn't be in the show. But I like having them in there because it serves the bigger show. And, hope, and the challenge now is to keep those bits in and make them funnier. Um, yeah, so by the time we get to Edinburgh or what have you, it is, it is a bit more poppy and, and solid. So what... If you were to review yourself honestly... What are the things that you would <coughs> pick on? What things are there? What things are there that you hope a reviewer doesn't notice? Um, I think sometimes you know performance uh, is is designed to cover up weaker writing, so yelling is helpful. Stamping the microphone stand, that not what's sound. <laughs> you kind of shock people. To, oh, this must be funny. He's, he's quite passionate about this. Um, oh, I just remembered one. I have, uh, I have a criticism, and you can, at your request, you can. Uh, I will take in it. my own bedroom. <laughs> um, you not the first time I've been criticised about bedroom. Several times, <laughs> wackety schmackety, <Ew. laughs> <laughs> which was the AO of uh, fifteen years ago. Yeah. Um, so you very frequently. Sla- laugh at yourself and slap the microphone uh, to your leg yeah. and bend over yeah. as if you have found that thing so hilarious and I just wonder if that, that and that's really my only criticism is that that moment seems a little contrived it seems a little bit bang the mic stand yeah, it yeah, seems yeah. a bit like I'm finding this hilarious it's like a double clap everyone starts a round of applause <laughs> do you, do you, do you accept, would you accept that criticism? I think that's from watching Chappelle, <laughs> who does seem to genuinely find himself really funny. Um, look, yeah, look, they're all tricks. I think probably more of them are real than not. I think in that, in that, if I if I find something funny in the show for what not not my own show, but if I find something happened in the room that amuses me, I, I really love laughing about that. Any, I mean, at this point of the show, anything that puts me back in the room. And ensures I'm not on autopilot, and then I am in front of living, breathing people performing and not reciting. Um, you see that, that thing Mark Thomas posted a couple of years ago of like the list of things he reads before. Have you, have you had him on the show? No, I don't know. I, I absolutely will do. I interviewed him a few years ago for a different BBC thing, and I got like a load of great Mark Thomas stuff that right. I don't own. Yeah. So I've sort of been waiting for that to wear off in my memory before I go in again and do it on the podcast. He just he put on Twitter this sheet of paper he reads before he goes on stage every every time. And it's amazing. And one of it is like, it's a, it's a performance, not a recital or something like that. And I just try to remember that because... I do say things pretty similarly every single time, so I got to try and remember that I'm not just spewing a script that I have. So anything that is, you know, a real genuine moment, including people doing something weird in the audience or someone responding in some way, I really try to have fun with that and keep it spontaneous and keep trying to be in it. And maybe sometimes that that trick of laughing and like, uh, yeah, banging the microphone on my leg is kind of a trick to shake me up a little bit and make me feel like I'm I'm. I'm a person reacting to things not for the first time. But some of it is... Is it? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, honestly. I'm not, that's not a justification for it, because it's probably a crutch that I should, uh, that I should face out of the show. You know? But um, I'll probably do it tonight. <laughs> but you're right, no, it's, it's absolutely First right. time you do it, you'll see my face looking at you. <laughs> you over a pair of imaginary mind no! spectacles. No! Tom. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it makes them laugh. That's all I it want. It makes them laugh. That's what it does. It well, makes them it. laugh. It doesn't, exactly. it doesn't get you back in the room. Piss off. It makes them laugh. Well, I can do both. But, yes, look, I mean, yeah, we've all got tricks that we're doing, and uh, 
and it is hard to let go of some lines and some easy things, particularly if they get a big laugh. You know the you know the uh, what's the uh, let's call him blank because that's his name. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, new new if, hack. There used to be a list on the Comcom website. The I had website, to take yeah. it off because. Um, uh, it, the system began to be abused and I can't remember I did keep it somewhere and I can't remember where they are but it's it's quite a funny list of stuff like that there's a blank um, person in every friendship group if and it's not it, then it's you. you yeah 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 a bad done, mind I've done so when I'm oh, so I was having sex the other night does deliberately bad mind uh, this isn't how I do it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and I've so, done them I've done them all Split Sider also tweeted a uh and like a, a whiteboard, a picture mm. of a whiteboard. I put it somewhere on the ComCom Pop Twitter feed, um, and it's American comics. It's yes. like it's exactly, but it's it's less formats, yeah. and it's more like if you were to play comedy bingo with American comedy at the moment, it's things like Lady Boner, and yeah. that's not a thing, oh. and the phrases like this. But you know, look at the end of the day, they're part of the common currency of yeah. us humans talking to each other. And uh, so they naturally find their way into conversation, but it's probably good to have a bit of time. Oh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. You've, you've got to try and purge. Yeah, it just takes a really long time. And that's part of, you know, losing the mimicking of other people. I don't think you'll, you know, we are all influenced to do comedy by comedians. So there's an element of the people that we're influenced by will always be part of us and who we are on stage. Obviously, we're all trying to, you know, move to our distinct voice as much as humanly possible. But yeah, those those obvious ones that make you feel even a little bit guilty saying, I think, yeah, you gotta we all gotta try to get better at uh, at checking them out. So to wrap up <laughs> <laughs> What was that? <laughs> that was me slapping my leg. <laughs> my <microphone. laughs> um what 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 do you want next from comedy? What what is the idea like someone could imagine that someone in your in your position, ten years from now, you could have your own TV show and it could be it could have a slightly political bent or it could not you could do the political stuff on your live show but actually you'd be a good host of a thing mm. Australia's daily show whatever what, what kind mm. of I mean those are the things that most commonly occur to me mm. what occurs to you and how how um, uh, deliberate are you in the acquisition of whatever the next goal is uh, it is hard to say I always think you know, people, people regularly ask, you know, what's, what's the dream gig? But I, I think ultimately, creatively, uh, in this business anyway, the, the dream is to have freedom, right? And to be in a position where you say, I want to do X, and people say, of course we will do X with you because you're Tom Weller or Stuart Goldsmith. You know what I mean? So it's like your, your currency is such that people will take risks with you and, you know, oh, I want to write a play. Cool, we'll make a play happen and we'll make it work because people want to see you entering the theatre world. Or, you know, here's my new TV idea. You know, there are, there are some people in the industry who will take literally any idea that comes out of their face, people are like, yes, let's do it because your name's on it and we, we love that. So that is like the long-term, you know, that is the dream where you have a body of work behind you that makes people excited about the new thing that you're going to make, right? Um, I, I really love TV. I've sort of dabbled. I've hosted one or two things and, um, it's good, but I'm not sort of des. I'm not, not desperate, but like, I am happy to not do television if I don't think it's good television. I, I'm not at the stage now where I have to, you know, being on TV outweighs the idea of doing bad TV. Uh, what have you turned down recently? Um... Uh, on TV, there was a hosting gig for a kind of family game show that didn't really tickle me at all. Um, was the money good? Uh, money would have been, yeah, would have been fine. Yeah. Would've it wasn't fine. like, oh, God, the money's good, but I don't want to do it. It was more like, I don't have to do this. Oh, you, can, you can turn it down because it's... I mean, radio, commercial radio was kind of an option to... So the radio station I worked for was a government station, public broadcaster... And they left that and then, you know, some people, lots of people come out of that world and then gone into commercial radio where the money is insane. I've it, heard it's in, in Australia, it's, yeah. yeah, lots of comedians go into it and it's crazy. Um, but having done uh, breakfast radio on a station that I really love, doing a show that I really love and still occasionally hating the hell out of that, yeah. the idea of doing it on a station that I'm not at all passionate about, playing Katy Perry... I'm actually, at that point, like, I don't care how much the money is because I would want to commit suicide. Um, 
So, yes, I guess I, it, certainly I'm at a lucky point where I have a, a bunch of uh, freedom and can choose, pick and choose a little bit and, and pursue stuff that really interests me. So I, I feel extremely lucky. I feel very, very lucky with everything and, and to want heaps more is uh, natural. <laughs> but, but probably, again, something I want to work on just to be fundamentally happy with where I am and be very thankful for where things are. Are you happy? I am, yes. I think I have no right to not be. That's my... That's not the same as being happy. Well, perspective... I find perspective to be the cure for all ills. So whenever I get like, oh, I didn't get that job, or oh, I didn't get nominated for the award, it's like, fuck, man. You're healthy. You're not a refugee locked up on Manus Island. You have get to do something you love for your job. You have beautiful people in your life. You have family and friends. No boyfriend, but not a big deal. Let's not stay, let's not stay on that, Stuart. Um, I, I, yeah, my life is extremely blessed. That's also not the same as being happy. Yeah, okay, your life is blessed. You've got no right not to be happy. But, like, are there moments when you go, I don't want this, or I've had enough of this, or I can't do it? Are there any, are there any moments for someone who has led your, arguably from the outside, charmed entrance into the, and, and, and success within the industry that you <coughs> most love in the world? Like, it's, you know, this is your your movie star this is like you know what I mean it's like mm. there's, the, there's my favourite thing mm. I'm absolutely working within it mm. are there any downsides to that are there any things when you think maybe I can't do this are there any moments when you think you know or is it just 100% self belief uh, um, well it's just all about I watched a video about this the other day happiness is all the gap between expectation and reality right so and you can only vaguely control the expectations. So if you change your expectations, then your happiness actually works itself out that way. So you control how you feel about your life and how things are and set up and what you are and aren't thankful for and what you view as, as great and not great. Um, so at any point where I feel like that, is what I'm saying, a stock take of how lucky I have been and how I have things to look forward to and how in this business, if you work hard and just try and make new interesting work, um, something will come of it. Um, the, the power to make things better is kind of in your hands. And where does that come from? Who taught, where do you learn that? I think my parents are concerned about social justice and they told me to be thankful for how lucky I am. I think I, think I learned that from them by example and also directly. And I read, I'm, I, I was, I'm intelligent, and I think if you're an intelligent person, it's hard to not think about, I mean, you just look at the rest of the world. The rest of the world's just fucking nuts. You know what I mean? And, to, to, and I know you've talked about this on the podcast before, but to be pursuing stand-up comedy in the Western world is like, you know, privilege personified, I think. So to be miserable about it, I think, is a bit indulgent. I understand some people in this business have some serious mental health stuff they got to sort out. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm with them and I stand with them and, and good luck to you, but I don't. So to be a miserable cunt is just uh, ridiculous. Thanks, man. No, no, works. Oh, no, 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 you are going to say something else. Well, the only other thing I was going to say is that when I feel like I want to, any time I feel like I, I should quit or do something else with my life, it's when I think about um, if there's a better way that I could sort of make things better, if I could help, you know, like actually go back to uni and finish the law degree that I dropped out after six weeks and become a human rights lawyer or something, you know what I mean? And is that an attractive idea? No. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that would, you know... That would what? That would, that would get me into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but it would, you know what I mean? Do you ever, do you ever think about that? Could I be doing more good elsewhere? The Ricky Gervais yeah. monologue at the end of Extras when on, on Celebrity Big Brother. I think it's the Christmas special. He's on Celebrity Big Brother. He has this huge monologue that's just like, I am a piece of shit. And the idea that this was the only possible career for me and I have to, I was a born performer. All that is just bullshit. I am a self-indulgent person who is desperate for affirmation from other people. All this is not this pathetic attempt to get on films and to do things like Celebrity Big Brother. This is the worst part of me, and um, I hate this so much. And I did it to the detriment of my friendship with this person. It's an amazing monologue. It's so beautifully written, and 
um, <clears throat> really, to me, like just narrow nailed the the self indulgence that's kind of inherent to this business a little bit. So that that kind of taps you on the back of the shoulder every so often. Yeah, and I I doubt I'm ever going to change it. Like, but but to be acknowledge and to aware, be aware of the fact that an element of doing this job, part of it is. Um, self-serving and wanting people to like you and needing that pretty badly if you can harness that and use it to make good work and to maybe do some good stuff then that's that's fine but don't pretend like what we're doing isn't a little bit look at me look at me i don't know surely people think that anyway oh god you're looking at me what did i say wrong that's fine. I was, just, I was just pausing because as soon as you finished a sentence, that's the end of the that's show. The end of the show. And you you were finishing a sentence really well. It was like, so what else is there? What's wrong? Is that a day? <laughs> I was like, oh, it was such a good out. It was such a good out. And so. now we're left with this. <laughs> So that was Tom. Do go and see him at the Edinburgh Festival this year. Uh, the show has, is called Problems. I wonder if he's going with the same poster. The poster is deeply unnerving. <laughs> um, it's a it's sort of deliberately photoshopped mistreatment of his face. Um, but uh, it's, it's very eye-catching indeed. Go along and see the show. Really, really recommend that. And he fully deserves to be as huge in the UK as he is uh, in Australia. Um, so that was Tom. Thank you. Should I do any thank yous? Thank you to Carl Chandler and Tommy Dasselow, who... Uh, who I think, believe Carl and uh, Tom Ballard also live together, um, for uh, treating me so nicely when I was in Australia and inviting me on their fantastic Dum Dum Club, the Little Dum Dum Club podcast, which I, I did an episode with Nick Cody and another guy whose name escapes me, but he was very funny. Sorry, can't remember your name immediately off the top of my head. Um, but you can find that album, by, you can find that podcast by searching for Little Dum Dum Club, D-U-M, D-U-M. Um, and, uh, and also Dave O'Neill, who is uh, uh, an Australian comic of some repute, and uh, and some standing who was kind enough to uh, invite me to meet a bunch of uh, fun other Aussie comics in some mysterious bar where everyone ate schnitzel. So uh, thanks to those guys as well. I'm just uh, recalling this podcast with Tom that's bringing back fond memories of uh, hanging out with those guys and uh, and also uh, taking part in the Little Dum Dum Club. So look out for that one. I mean, I really, I've never laughed on stage as much uh, during a, a podcast recording. It's a very different thing to ComCom but I think you guys will really enjoy it. So check that out. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, thank you for your donations. Thank you for people that continue to donate or join the Patreon or go to comedianscomedian.com forward slash donate. There will shortly be waiting for me when I get back home after this weekend away and the week doing shows. Um, waiting for me is uh, the first tester, the first sample of the new uh, ComCom t-shirt. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to see it. I'm going to see it probably about one o'clock in the morning when I get home and, uh, and tear open the packaging. And hopefully then we, we hit go and we go into pre-sales mode and I'm going to make a, a limited number of these t-shirts available uh, in advance and print them specially to your size requirements. So we'll do a run of those um, and uh, I'll give you some more information on those very soon, hopefully in next week's episode. As I said, loads and loads of great shows coming up. Very excited to already have uh, Simon Munnery, Barry Cryer, Pippa Evans and plenty more besides. And that's all for now. I will chat to you briefly. Thank you to everyone that missed out on the postamble last week and, uh, and complained about it. There's a little postamble coming up in just a second. But for now, that concludes the podcast. Speak to you soon. Oh, so we'll just have a little a little quickie postamble now. I always intend for it to be a quickie. It very rarely is. Um, but uh, yes, so lots of you. I, I tell you what's happening uh, wedding-wise. I got technically married, or as we say, married uh, the other week, and it was very exciting. We expected it to be uh, we expected it to be a little sort of you know not entirely a formality, but it was like the registry office do. It's sort of an attempt to save five hundred quid by not getting a registrar out to the big bash, which is. In a week now, <laughs> it'll be happening right now. Uh, no, it's Monday. It'll be. It will have happened in a week. It's in less than a week. My God. Um, so, uh, so we did the little kind of mini registry office thing, and the Boutros proved himself to be an excellent dancer, doing a little shoulder shimmy in my arms as uh, as we played the final track, which, out of interest, was uh, the uh, it was brand new Colony by the Postal Service. We played that. It starts with the beautiful little bleepy uh, uh, bleepy notes, and the Boutros was in my arms 
and a little shimmy. We've got a lovely picture of everyone applauding as <laughs> he's, he's mid dance and I'm mid hoot. And my new wife is looking on, um, probably depressed that her <laughs> men, her boys are such total idiots. But um, what a wonderful day it was. Thank you to everyone that got in touch uh, about that. Uh, thank you, many of you. But the, it's all secret and embargoed. And <laughs> I'll just explain what happened. What happened was me and the missus decided because we've got a lot more people coming to the big sort of festival type bash this coming weekend. We thought we'll just nip off very close. Not even the whole families, just a couple of people, close people, nearby people. We did a little mini thing and there were lovely pictures of it. And we said, let's not put the pictures on social media because we don't want people coming to the big thing to feel like they've missed out or, you know, been left out of the little mini one. So we thought, fine, that's the rule. And then, of course, all over the place, you guys, to whom I had previously done a post amble about how excited I was to do the registry office bit, and at that time didn't know about the embargo, you all got in touch. And then suddenly, my wife, my new wife, my, my new and exciting wife, got a fresh wife. Um, uh, the fresh wife was... Uh, uh, she was a little bit like, not aggrieved, but she was a little bit like, oh God, Stu, we're not supposed to be telling everyone. I'm like, I know, but this, I didn't know that days ago when I released the thing. So anyway, I appreciate all of your thanks is what I'm saying. And um, I'm very uh, excited to do the, the big thing coming up. And then it will be over. And I feel like, well, it will be just begun, of course, but the event itself will be over. And um, I feel very much like I'm suddenly going to get all this extra free time in my life. But I'm sure the next thing will um, will quickly absorb it. That's how time and organisation tends to work. Do you ever think to yourself, either I'm an, a, a workaholic or... I'm literally lazy and I'm just madly telling myself I'm a workaholic. Do you ever think that? I can't be a workaholic. I don't get enough done to be a workaholic. I, see, I, I looked at another... <laughs> you should never do this. I looked at another comedian's website. Another comedian has a very successful podcast and um, is someone for whom I'm... Uh, uh, they're a useful, they're a useful pacemaker. They're one of those people in life. You look at their stuff and you go, "Oh God, they're, God, they're all over this. I better work harder." And it sent me down this whole funnel of uh, of uh, anxiety that I'm probably only just recovering from now, some few hours later. Um, so uh, that's you know, is that a good thing to do? Do you see do you see other people and go, "Oh God, I've got to do more." But then it's all through the filter of, of obviously a lot of the time you see their stuff on social media and as a result you think, oh, this is what they're up to all the time and they're not. We all just like to give that impression. Well, this person in particular is someone who just gets a squillion things done and it does make you think... It's not herring, by the way. I know you all think it's herring. It's not. Um, there's just a lot of people out there doing a lot of stuff and you think by any objective measure, I could be doing more. But what I want to do is hang out with my baby for a bit. The tour is finished. I want to hang out with my family and, and just put my baby on my head and have a little sleep. <laughs> that's all I want. Get married and then have a little sleep. That's, that's the plan. So, um, so that's, that's kind of allowed, right? Except, wham, suddenly it's June. It's bloody June. I've got to do an Edinburgh show now. I've got to throw it all together. God. I really, it, I think the dream scenario somewhere down the line is do Edinburgh and then immediately tour for two months. And then that's done, right? You've done three months of touring. And then the rest of the time, you just ride a speedboat around the place, lie in a heap. That's all I want. I've got a, I've got a bit in my show at the moment about the new show, about... Um, yeah, I've got a bit in the new show. The, the new show exists. It exists. It's a thing. It's... Um, it's by no means ready, but it uh, it does exist, and I've got a bit in it about how most people just want to with our with our jobs. Most of us just want to make enough money to stop. <laughs> I don't know where my love of comedy and my regarding of comedy is a calling. I don't know whereabouts that fits into that, but uh, there is certainly. I, I don't think it's uniquely British, is it? It's just a uniquely human, uniquely human. That's a funny title. Um, uh, it's just a human instinct, isn't it? To just go, whoa, wouldn't it be great to just do nothing and sit on a beach eating ice cream? Of course it wouldn't. There'd be sand and probably, you know, rays and things like that. Oh, I've run out of steam completely. I'm nervous about a thing that I can't tell you about. And I'm also nervous about the Joe Brand podcast, which is tonight. And I am sure is going to be absolutely lovely because they all, I mean, they invariably are. 
Um, but I just get so nervous before them. Can anyone, it can't just be imposter syndrome. It's the fear of being caught out. So here's my request for this, for today's post Um, How do you cope with, how do I move forward with this? I, I've, I, have I talked about this before on the show? I get nervous before every single podcast. If they're my best mate, if they're someone huge, if they're whoever they are, I get nervous and I spend it because I feel like I'm going to be caught out. I feel like they're going to go, you don't know anything about me. You haven't done your research. Oh, you, or I make some stupid mistake or something like that. I'm over 200 episodes in now. If anything, the feeling has got worse, not better. I know that it's completely illogical. How do I attack it? Someone give me a steer on that. It's not, it's not imposter syndrome. I, don't, I, I mean, I do suffer from that sometimes, but I don't think it's that. I think it's something else. It's being caught out fear of syndrome or something like that. So give me your thoughts. <laughs> Get in touch with me at ComComPod or you can, uh, on Twitter or you can join the Comedians Comedian Facebook group that now has over 5,000 absolute legends uh, and uh, is quite a fun place to find out more stuff about what we're up to and indeed get your, your pre-sale orders in for the um, uh, slightly cheaper, brand new, spanking and delightful ComComPod t-shirts as designed by... American artist Polly Becker. So that's all for now. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one with Tom. I'll be back very soon with more stuff. Bye.